So welcome back, everybody. It's October 4th, I think. Um, just as a reminder, there's a couple things that we do here at Mountain Ridge Church to get the information out, okay? So the first thing I would share with you is that on the website, way at the bottom, so go to mountainridgechurch.org, way at the bottom, you can click the buttons to our talks, and you can have most of all the talks we've done, and you can have all the um, scripture references, uh, if you want to read over them or print them out, copy, paste, whatever. The other thing is on uh, Facebook, uh, we will also put out the links on Facebook to, you can tap and go to the YouTube channel. And in Facebook, we are under Mountain Ridge Church. And if you go to YouTube, you have to look under MRC Dillsburg, and it's a real help if you're at home and you hit subscribe. So if you're at YouTube, and then you search for MRC Dillsburg and it comes up, then tap the button where it says subscribe, and then all this will come up. So anyway, just a quick reminder of that. Also, we've had some people ask questions about giving during the pandemic and you know how do you give and certain, certain things like that. On the website, you can tap the button that says donate. You can have your bank uh, send us a check. You can give on PayPal. You can do all sorts of things and all that stuff is on the website. So we want to continue to jump into the series we're in. The series we're in is called Redeemed and Forgiven. And I really need to start with the foundation that Sam set for us last week that helps us walk into what we want to deal with today. Last week, Sam shared the seven ways that we can mess up grace. And I just have to tell you, the talk was really helpful and it was really redemptive because one of the things he did last week is he gave us handles on how to keep grace simple. And how did he do that? Well, one of the things he asked was, and the main point of his message was, when you think of Christianity and when you think of grace, what, what do you think of? What, what's one word or one sentence that you would put to that? And he said, if you um, share... It, if you share what your thoughts are about that, and it doesn't somehow include Jesus, a bloodstained cross, or an empty tomb, chances are you're probably overcomplicating it. And I thought his talk was so helpful and redemptive in helping us understand, yes, grace is about God. Grace is about us entering into that. And the reason I thought it was helpful is so many times people in religion can make grace so much more complicated than it really is. And uh, I just want to share with you um, just how redemptive grace is. Um, this week, I'm going to talk about the reality that Christianity grace, it's not about us. It's not about our sin. It's not about our failures. It's not about our successes, our knowledge, and our accomplish accomplishments. Christianity and God's grace, it's about God. It's about what he's up to. It's about what he's done. I'm going to read it for you in Galatians. Paul wrote this. He said, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by trying to keep the Jewish laws? Of course not. For the Holy Spirit came upon you only after you heard about Christ and trusted in him to save you. Then have you gone completely crazy? For if by trying to obey the Jewish laws never gave you spiritual life in the first place, why do you think by trying to obey them now will make you stronger Christians? And in, in, in that's all, that's Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. I love how that last question is read in the message version. I want to read it for you. Paul wrote it like this, uh, and the message version says it like this. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could ever perfect it? Grace is about God. It's about what he's done. It's not about us. It's not about our sin and our attempts to be a perfect person. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, that kind of brings me relief because here's the reality. If grace depended on me, are you kidding? I'd blow it by lunch. Like, I, I don't know about you, but if it was dependent on me, it's a sad story. I'm so grateful that the message of grace is about God and what he's done. He's consistent. I'm really not. And today, one of the things I want to do is I want uh, to talk about grace a little bit more. I want to remind you about who you are, what Scripture says about who you are once we believe in Jesus. And 
I just want to continue to say this, that I'm so grateful for last week's message from Sam because it's really important to understand how simple it is about how we enter into what God is doing. So I'd really encourage you to go back and watch that if you haven't seen that. So today we're going to talk about who you are. We're going to read a little bit about scripture um, that, that talks about who you are, and uh, we're going to jump into this today. So how are we going to do this? Well, I'm, I'm going to read three scriptures. The first scripture is Galatians 4.7. And then I'm going to read John 1.12, and then I'm going to read Galatians 3.26. Let's just jump into the scriptures. Now we are no longer slaves, but God's own sons. And since we are his sons, everything he has belongs to us, for that is the way God planned. What does that scripture mean? That's an alarming scripture. That means we are the children of God. Jump into the next one. To all who received him. He gave the right to become children of God. All they needed to do was to trust him to save them. That's a remarkable verse, right? All you need to do, and this is called grace, is trust him. Invite him into your life. And he gives you the privilege of being called a child of God. Let's read the next one. For now, we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, I left the last verse um, to be the most direct one. Um, I, I'd really encourage you to go find that in Scripture in the Living Bible Translations, Galatians 3.26. For now, we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So who are we? Well, Scripture tells us we're children of God. If we've given our lives over to Jesus, we've invited him in. If we trust him, it says we're children of God. So why do we continue to share this with you? Like, we've had weeks in this series, and Sam and I are just talking about God's grace. We're sharing scriptures about God's grace. In worship, we are singing songs about God's grace. Why do we keep doing this? Because God's grace continues to be the most important part and the most understood part, I believe, of Christianity. Imagine what would happen in your life if you believe to the core of who you are. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. That, that, that's an amazing thing. Like, are you kidding me? I'm allowed to be called his son, his daughter? Are you kidding me? I can walk into the day every day with God on my side. Like, I can walk through life with courage and, and ferocious, unapologetic. Like, I can attack life way. Like, are you kidding me? That's amazing, right? I want to share a story with you to maybe help understand what this looks like. Um, years ago, I heard this story and um, I've, I've taught on it a couple times. I just want to share it with you again. So imagine if you were like living hundreds of years ago, it's the days of kings and queens. And one day the king announces that prostitution is illegal across the land, across the territory. It's just illegal, right? Now repent, uh, pretend with me that you live in a far off town and you are a prostitute and you hear the king's order. And it's kind of shakes you up a little bit because now you're going to uh, you're going to be uh, basically an, uh, a person who's outside the king's orders and you're, you're illegal. So one day the king's soldiers show up and they've identified you, and so they capture you, arrest you, and uh, then you have to go back to where the king is and be imprisoned. Right. So your life, as you know, it is over. You're a convicted criminal and you're serving out your judgment. About a year later, the king just kind of walks through prison and he sees you and he tells the jailer, hey, release this one. I'm going to meet with this person uh, in my castle soon. Prepare them, you know, just feed them, get them to my castle. And so um, moments later, you're standing before the king and the king says, here's the deal. I think you're beautiful. I love you and I want to make you my queen. So if you accept... Uh, the invitation, I want to marry you, and you're going to be the queen of the land. From today, forevermore, you're going to be my queen, and you're going to be the queen of this country. Now, let's just stop for a second, and let's ask a few questions about that story. Assuming you accept the king's invitation, when you become queen, my question is, who are you? Are you a prostitute? Are you a convicted criminal? Are you the queen of the land? Like, who are you? And so my final question is, how are you going to live? 
Like, are you going to live every day depressed and sad because you were a convicted criminal? Are you going to live every day from now uh, moving forward with like this uh, unapologetic, ferocious courage? Like, I'm the queen. I've got the ring in my hand. I've got the throne right next to the king. Like, how are you going to live? And, and here's what I want you to see. That story is exactly what Jesus has done for you. He's freed you. And now you're part of his family. Actually, Scripture uses the analogy that Jesus is the, the groom and we're the bride and Jesus is coming for us. Now, let's slow down and think about this. If this is true, how do you live? Do you walk through life every day depressed and sad because of your past sins and failures and fears? Or do you look at who you are today as a child of God? I know in the story, the analogy we used was, was being queen, but now we're a child of God. Do you walk into the future with this unapologetic, ferocious courage, knowing that as of today, I'm a child of God? Or do you walk into the future with fear? I, I, you just have no idea the joy I have in sharing with you, this is what God has done for you. He's freed you. Uh, you, 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 according to scripture, we're children of God. This is the most amazing thing. Grace is amazing. Grace is not about the church and rules and striving through life to live out some religious standard. No, grace is about the temple curtain being ripped apart when Jesus at three o'clock gave up his life. And at three o'clock that afternoon, it, the curtain just was ripped and God was unleashed from that small room and he was released into all of us, you and me, like for everyone who believes in him, he was released into us. It's simply, grace simply is not about church rules and striving to live out religious standards. It's so much more. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. Okay, remember when I told you a couple weeks back that I think the greatest problem for the North American church is, I, I, I really don't think a lot of folks, and I'm not trying to be sassy or confrontational to say this, but I don't think a lot of North American churches, or, uh, folks who attend them, are really um, able to wrap their minds around God's grace. I don't think a lot of us are being transformed by God's grace. And I, and I think that that leads us into what I want to talk about a little bit today. One of the reasons we struggle to grasp God's grace and be transformed by it is we're not, we're not living like children of God. We hear what the pastor says. We know the verses. I just shared them with you. We, we know the verses about what Scripture says. But for some reason, that is information that kind of stays in the head. It doesn't go to the heart, and it doesn't show up in the way we live right? It seems to be information and knowledge. It just doesn't show up into our emotions and our hearts and the way we raise children and the way we attack life and the way we love our spouses, right? We don't tend to remind ourselves every day who we are. We struggle to live out the fact that we're, we're the queen of the land. We struggle to live out that we're children of God. And um, I think sometimes we hear this information like, you're a child of God. And we uh, jump into the day and we're still living in fear. And we're still very timid about what's happening around us, right? And what is really weird, and I like bringing it up just because I think it's a, it's a great understanding of, of faith. What's really weird about this is we truly believe that if we give our lives to Christ, God's going to get us to heaven someday. Like, think about that. Like, when, 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 when I die, like, the outside part of me is done, but the inside part of me is somehow still alive. And we believe somehow that inside part, somehow God's going to get us somehow into heaven. We don't know quite where it is, but somehow it's going to get there. And he has a mansion for us. So somehow God has the power to do all that. But I don't know if he's going to come through for me today. Is that, is that weird to you? Is it strange? I think it is. I think we should have the same faith that God is going to get us into heaven and prepare a place for us. Somehow he's got, he has the power and authority to do that. I also believe he has the same power and authority to take care of you today, right? By the way, that faith struggle, that's really not new to Christianity. That doesn't make us bad Christians. This, this stuff has been going on for generations. There's, a, there's a, a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote a much younger Timothy. And uh, we know there are letters uh, written to Timothy because it's in the book called 
Timothy, I, I know it's, it's high level stuff, and I want to read it for you because Paul was writing at Timothy, who's kind of struggling with this, and it's in uh, 2 Timothy verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, Paul wrote Timothy this, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but love, power, and self-discipline. One of the reasons I believe we struggle to fully grasp God's grace and we struggle to have God's grace transform us is we're not living like we are children of God. We call it faith. Instead, I think our natural tendency is to live in fear and timidity. Now, just to be clear, this is really important to bring out, just to be clear, we're all going to experience moments of fear, all of us. I do, you do, we all do. We're going to have absolute moments of fear. You're going to face something and you're going to be afraid of it. That we, Everybody goes through it. What I'm talking about is we don't have to be defined by fear. You're going to face fear and by God's grace, you can overcome it. Um, that's everybody. You're going to have moments when you face fear, but you don't have to be defined by it. You don't have to have fear kind of push you into the center of life and, and give you this feeling like I'm so afraid to attack life and, and you don't have to stay there. God's grace gives you the power to overcome it. So we will all experience negative fear, um, fear of starting a new job, meeting new people, taking the test you don't want to take, fear of taking chances, fear of watching kids do something new, fear of a, uh, a failure, fear that no one likes you. We all face those fears. That's reality. It's part of life. Again, it doesn't mean, mean it's going to define us, right? Because God's grace, it gives us the power and authority to face those fears and overcome them. You must, must, must face fears and overcome them. It, it's called faith. So I just wanna really make sure we bring out the, the part that you're going to face fear. Now, if there are kids in the room listening to this, what this means is, as you're going through middle school and high school, you need to try new things. You need to jump into the test. You need to try out for the sport. You need to be very good if you can at the sport. You need to take the test to get into college. You need to start the new job. Like, don't allow the things uh, that, that are, are pushing in on you, don't allow them to stop you. No, that's normal. Everyone faces fear. Ask your parents to pray with you, overcome your fear, and you're going to have butterflies in the belly. Yes, I don't like them, you don't like them, but this is what we need to face fear and overcome it, and we call that growing up. We call that becoming an adult. For God's grace and its transformational power to grow in you, we must act like we're children of God. And I'm not talking, when I say act, I'm not talking one bit about being fake. What I'm saying is, I'm going to believe that I'm a son of God. I'm going to believe I'm a daughter of God, and I'm going to live with faith, right? And we see it all over Scripture, don't we? Like, God shows up to Noah and says, hey, build a boat. By faith, Noah built a boat. Uh, we see these moments with Jesus and Peter. Jesus says, hey, Peter, get out of the boat. And by faith, Peter gets out of the boat. We see this with Paul. Hey, Paul, build churches for people who don't go to church. And by faith, Paul built churches for people who don't go to church. I want you to see um, four things today. I'm just going to share them with you. Four things that I hope gives you handles on how to experience God's grace and be transformed by it. And I believe it begins by reminding ourselves that we're children of God. And when I say that to you, and you're at home watching this, we have to remind ourselves that we're children of God. Doesn't that seem like first grade-ish? Like, doesn't that seem so simple? Like, yeah, we know. But my question would be, how many people are starting the day and they're giving conscious thought to, this is the price God paid for my new identity. And I'm gonna walk in that new identity today. See, I think it's really super simple to hear I just don't think a lot of people are doing it, right? I want to read for you Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 in the message version. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become well-adjusted, so well-adjusted to your culture that you just fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. 
the best way to jump into the ordinariness of the day is to fix your attention on God. Did, did you see that part in there? It says embracing what God has done for you. You know what that means? That literally means you're focused on the price God paid for you and the price he paid to give you a brand new identity. You focus on that. You focus on his grace. You focus on what God has done. Remember, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your sin, your failures, your successes, your attempts to live out a perfect life. Nothing like that. Your identity is about God and what he has done for you, right? And here's why. Because before you were born, God had a plan. And his plan was to redeem you. You and I can't produce that stuff. It's about God, right? It was always about God. This should humble you. This should bring you peace. Like, think about that. Before you're born, God, you know, knitted you together in, in your mama's belly. And he had an idea, he had a plan. He's like, I'm, I'm going to pursue him and I'm going to pursue her and I'm going to redeem them. That, that, that should just be unbelievably humbling, right? It should bring you peace. It should bring you joy. And it should really give you this kind of unapologetic, ferocious courage to just kind of walk through life. It should really give you help on overcoming negative emotions that hit you. We all experience these negative emotions, right? Emotions like uh, fear, guilt, stress, anxiety, and on and on, right? We all face those things. But when you realize you're a child of God and you realize before you're born, your father in heaven had a plan to redeem you, man, that should absolutely be a game changer. And so I believe the longer we go without reminding ourselves about God's grace, without reminding ourselves of the price God has paid for our new identity, I really think we start taking on life by ourselves. And what happens is God is no longer the center of our lives. We are the center of lives. And um, if God isn't the center of your life right now, I really have a, a question for you. And again, I'm not trying to be sassy. If you're going through life and you're not reminding yourself who God is in your life and his grace, I, I have a question for you. And the question goes something like this. How's life going for you? Again, I'm not trying to be confrontational or, or sad. I'm just seriously, like if God's not the center, how's life going for you? Are you tired? Uh, do you feel like you have more questions than answers? Do you fear anxiety and stress? Maybe the greatest thing you can do is embrace God and what he's done for you. Maybe the greatest thing you can do every day is remind yourself this is the price God paid for my identity, and this is what God says about who I am, and I'm going to today live like a child of God. I want God to be the center of my life. I want his grace to be the center of my life. So for us to be uh, experience God's grace and be transformed it, I also say I think we need to talk to God directly. We call it prayer, right? All you need to do is walk right up to God and say, boom, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. I'm going to talk to you. This is why I say this, this is in Galatians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Are you ready? Like, buckle up. I don't know if you knew this is true. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So please, don't lose heart because of my trials here. Did, did you just hear what I said? Because of Christ, we can boldly and confidently walk into the presence of God. Are you kidding me? I'm able to walk into the presence of God. Every time I talk to him on my way to work, every time I talk to him in the beginning of the day, every time I talk to him at dinner time, every time I talk to him, I'm literally walking into the presence of God. Are you kidding me? If this is true, why in the world would we ever start a day without walking into the presence of the king, the alpha and the omega, the one who just spoke creation into existence? Listen, you don't avoid God because you're afraid you're not good enough. No, 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 no. Um, you don't have to go to a person who you think is holier than you. No, 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 no. You don't have to go to a person and say, oh, you have a better connection. You have the word pastor in front of your name, so you have a better connection. So I want you to, to no, 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 no. That's not what scripture says at all. That's not why Jesus hung on the cross. You walk right up to God right now. Maybe you need to hit pause on this thing right now and just walk into God's presence right now. And with courage and boldness, you pray and you talk and you let God know everything you're feeling. 
because he already knows he's God. And when you pray, you need to understand you have the exact same connection as everybody who's praying. You understand, right? Three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus died and that temple curtain ripped open and God's presence was released. It was released for you. It, it wasn't released for pastors. It was released for you. It wasn't released for a select few. No, it was released to everybody. So when you pray, you have the same connection as everybody else who prays. One of the things that really breaks my heart, I'm just going to be very honest with you as a pastor, actually even someone, um, it broke my heart even before I was a pastor, was this idea that people would say, I need you to pray for it. You have a connection. You have a connection. You're holy. So I'm going to come to you because I want you to pray to God. And it just breaks my heart, it literally just want, makes me want to scream because even when people joke about it, it, to me, it's just not funny. No, as much as we preach about it, read scripture about it, sing songs about it, people still believe or they don't want to believe that they're children of God, that they have a direct access to their father. That breaks my heart. It makes me angry and sad all at the same time. No, you don't need me to pray for you. You need to pray. You have a direct connection to God. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a pastor. God has given Sam and I authority. I get it. And uh, when people are sick, we do anoint them with oil, like Scripture says, and we pray for them. So there is a place for pastor and, and our prayers. I understand that. What I'm trying to do is encourage you to understand you need to walk and act like a child of God. He's in you. And so to not pray ever and then come to Sam and I and say, hey, pray for us, you're, 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 not, you're not acting like a child of God. God's in you, right? So anyway, I, that's just something that really has always broken my heart. It, I, again, it makes me uh, angry and sad all at the same time. I just want to encourage you to understand the price that Jesus paid for you to stay in God's presence. Never avoid God's presence. Never avoid prayer. Uh, Jesus paid too much of a price for you to say, nah, I don't want his presence. No, he paid the price so you could boldly and courageously just walk into his presence. Okay, with courage you pray. And if you're new at prayer think, uh, and, and, um, and you think you're going to mess it up, you can't. Prayer's not about perfect words. It's not about how long it is, how short it is. It's about your heart. Listen, in my office right now, um, it's loaded with lots of things. What do you think the most meaningful things are in my office, right? It's when my kids, they wrote poems, they have pottery they gave me over the years, and they have artwork. And honestly, if someone came into my office and saw it, it looks terrible, right? Why? Because a five-year-old doesn't produce Monet's, right? What do you think is most valuable to me in that office? Everything my kids ever did for me. Why? Because they're my kids. They were sharing with me at age four and five and six and even older. <laughs> They're sharing with me their love. It means more to me than even like you were to buy me a Monet and put it in my office. Now, just to be clear, if we sold the Monet and made millions, that'd be great. But what I'm saying <laughs> are those, those, those pieces of pottery that are just a mess looking. They mean the world to me, right? What I'm trying to let you know is that when you stumble into God's presence and you share innocent words, they're the most beautiful to God. They are. You, you can't mess this up. If you think you're going to mess it up, you're, you're, you're stuck in religion mode. If, if you think you're going to mess it up, you're stuck with your, you're thinking my behaviors matter uh, more than, no, your heart, your heart, your heart. You stumble into God's presence and you just open your heart and you just, you, you can't mess it up. Okay, okay. so with courage, you pray. If your kids are sick, you get the family around and pray. Before you eat, you pray. If the kids, uh, before the kids go to school, you pray. And when you're facing hard times as a family, you get together and you pray and you stumble through an imperfect prayer and you release God's presence into your family. Like, I have a question for you. Like, when, when you pray, are you afraid of being, um, like, embarrassed? I'm going to mess it up. I'm not going to say the wrong words, right? Again, you, you can't mess this up. I, I would have another question to follow up with this. Like, why are you afraid to mess it up? Like, the first time you rode a bike, how'd that go? 
right? The first time I rode a bike, I fell down and I, I still have a scar in my leg from, from running into a barbed wire fence and it bleeding. Like the first time you rode a bike, how'd it go? On your first date, how did that go? Did you nail it? Were you amazing? Or was it really weird and clunky, right? Your first kiss. We're not supposed to talk about that at church, right? Your first kiss. Was it awesome or did you just kind of clink teeth and you messed that one up too? <laughs> it's funny stuff. You probably messed it up, right? Here's the deal. Start praying today. You can't mess it up. You can't mess it up. The, the, the stuff in my office uh, that means nothing to everybody else, means the world to me. Your, your, your prayers that you're going to stumble through, they mean the world to God. Never settle to avoid God because Jesus paid a deep price for you to be able to stand in his presence. So thirdly, for us to experience God's grace and be transformed uh, by it, I, I think you need to know that your comfort zone, it's not your friend. Your comfort zone, the rut and routine you're in, it's not your friend. Um, I, I know you like it because it's comfortable, but it's not your friend. I'm gonna read for you the interaction between Jesus and Peter. Uh, this is in Matthew chapter 14, verses 29 to 31. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? Now, nowadays, if Peter would have stepped out of the boat, we'd have to celebrate him, give him a trophy, and be like, well, that's great, you did something. I know I'm being snarky. But back in the day, Jesus looks at Peter oddly, and he's like, what's your deal? Pete, you, you should have nailed this one. Like, what, 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 is, what is wrong with you? you? You should have more faith in me. He confronts him and Jesus invites him out of the boat, out of the like everything that makes sense and the security to do the unthinkable. And he gets out of his comfort zone and he literally begins to stumble and, and Jesus confronts him like, dude, you should have had more faith. Please hear me. For us to experience God's grace and be transformed by it, you're going to have to follow Jesus even if it takes you outside of your comfort zone even if it takes you outside of your comfort zone. That, that it's the core of, of, of experiencing God's grace because I've been so transformed by it, I'm going to follow him anywhere. And even if I fear, feel fear, I'm going to follow him anywhere, right? So let's, let's talk about a couple things that you might be stuck. You might feel like you're in a rut routine. Let's talk about a few things. Like if you're hurt and angry, we forgive. If you have an enemy, you serve them. If you're greedy, you become generous. If you're gossip and negative all the time, you build up and encourage. If you have negative emotions, you have faith that God's, if they're not gonna define you. God's grace is gonna define you. If you don't give, you give. If you're rebellious, you submit. If you wanna be great, Jesus says, you serve. If you are afraid of everything and you don't try something new, you try something new. You feel the butterflies in the belly. Yes, you try something new. I have to tell you, your comfort zone is not your friend. And it'll always make you, your comfort zone will always make you the center of your life. It will not make God the center of your life. So let me ask you, how are you following after God? When's the last time God led you and you needed faith to follow him? Or everything in your life that you do, is it just comfortable, right? Are you in a rut? Are you finding that instead of being grateful in your life that you're becoming critical? That can be a sign that you're stuck in your comfort zone. You're in a rut and routine and you're going nowhere. One last thing, every time you mess it up, because you will, I have, every time you mess up living this whole God's grace is gonna transform me, every time you mess it up, what do we do? You run back to God. You run right up to God confidently, you encourage and you say, dad, I blew it. You run right back to God and you allow God's grace to overwhelm you and pour his, his grace over you to, to, to just kind of wash away guilt and fear and sin like you would wash mud off of an old boot. You just allow God to just, just absolutely wash that stuff away. That's why scripture says we embrace what God has done for us. It's the best thing scripture says that we can do for him. So let's close with this. I want you to understand and remember that story I told you earlier. God freed you from prison. He's forgiven you. And now you're a child of God. How do we know this? Well, it's all over scripture. Now it's time that you live like it. Now, before we move on, I, I just want to push in. Like, this isn't about information. This is, it's good information, but, it, but, it, uh, but if it doesn't go anywhere, it's dead information, right? So 
Are you experiencing this, right? Now it's time to live like it. So how are you living? Are you living in fear all the time? Are you always reminding yourself of your sin and failure? No. Are you regretting your past? Are you afraid of tomorrow? Are you stressed about today? Or are you living every day with this unapologetic kind of ferocious courage? It's time to live like you're a child of God. Allow God's grace to transform you. Have faith. Go to God with courage. Remember, your comfort zone probably isn't your friend. Whew, that was a lot, right? I pray, we pray, that as you experience God's grace, it transforms you. It's not something stuck in your head. It's something that shows up in the way you live. Unapologetic, ferocious courage. Are you kidding me? We're a children of God. We'll see you next week.